for the start of the Global Trends track sponsored by Bidstack. I'd like to welcome to the virtual stage, uh, a regular at our events, uh, the uh, CEO of Game Analytics to speak about uh, 2020 so far and how the mobile games industry is changing. So please give a virtual round of, award, of, of applause to uh, Ioanna Reninchuk uh, from, uh, from Game Analytics. Uh, Ioana, how you doing? Are you, uh, you all set up? Hi, everyone. Hey, I'm going um, to duck out into the background and, and leave it to you if you've got everything you need. Yeah, I think I do. I'm going to share my screen and mm -hmm. start the presentation. Um, OK, hope, uh, hope everybody can, can see this. Um, I would love to say that it's great to see you all, but um, I can't. <laughs> so in any case, it, it's at least great to be able to share this information with you. Um, uh, just to uh, put this into context, uh, this is extremely, extremely fresh. Uh, the data goes back literally to um, last week. So it's very, very new data. Um, some of it is uh, from uh, Benchmarks Plus. So um, end of 2019, uh, we at Game Analytics really, uh, released Benchmarks Plus. Um, it's a benchmarking tool that looks through core metrics in the industry uh, and the top quantiles of games, like the top 10% of games versus the top 5%, 2%, and so on. So you can always tell how your game is doing compared to others uh, in the same genre um, for core metrics like retention, session length, um, um, IAP revenue, and most recently some advertising KPIs, which we received uh, from our friends from uh, Adjust. Um, the size of the data is absolutely massive, so we truly believe it, rep it represents the industry. We've passed 2 billion monthly players. Um, when we launched this, it was like 1.25 billion, so um, network has been growing. Uh, 22 billion monthly sessions, 100,000 games. So it is, we feel, a relevant data set for, for the scale of the industry. Um, and uh, these are some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Industry snapshots, so literally uh, what's been happening in the industry, how things have been moving up and down, what's happening with retention, because I know many of you have been launching games and it's, um, uh, you know, retention has had a very clear pat pattern. Uh, there's some learnings in session length, uh, CPI, um, and of course we're going to um, see how you can get these things from benchmarks as well. Um, okay. So, um, you know, the moment you've been waiting for, um, the industry change uh, week on week. So we've highlighted, uh, so you can see this starts from like the first full week uh, in January, so from the 6th of January to 25th of May. Um, and uh, the change, this highlights uh, the dark line at the top is uh, just overall um, use, unique users that we see. Um, and um, the bars are the change that we, we have seen compared to the week before. So every one of those bars represents change in that week compared to the week before. So it, interestingly, uh, I want to highlight some things here. Um, when China started lockdown, um, as opposed to uh, the other two regions, so Europe, the US, there was a small drop. Um, it seems like in China, um, there, the drop just came, uh, the increase in traffic came the following week. Um, and um, I, probably this is because at the time everything was new and it was taking time for people to adapt. Probably people were queuing to buy toilet paper uh, instead of being on their phones uh, the first few days. But still, then there was we saw then a consistent increase in in traffic um, and somewhat somewhat of a stabilization um, towards late February, early March. However, the uh, the big increase in traffic. Um, is the moment that Europe went into lockdown, so uh, mid-March. And then shortly after, the U.S. also started to go into lockdown. Um, if you have all seen some, um, the, some analysis we published later this year, playtime changes actually differently. So um, the change in users seems to follow very clearly the actual moments. Um, and whereas the change in how much people were playing uh, seemed to happen a bit earlier. So people, initially people started to play more, the people that were already playing were playing more, and then more people were playing as well, which probably explains why even though the growth is very high in uh, March, 
actually the peak in traffic is uh, somewhere like towards end of March, beginning beginning of April. That's actually when uh, the peak happens. So before kind of the, the growth starts to become uh, negative, of course, because by then all this growth, all this positive growth was compounded by the end of March. And that's when things really, really kind of uh, peaked massively. Then things started to normalize a bit. However, uh, you can probably see that the decrease, the orange lines, uh, they do not make up for, you know, how much kind of growth, growth there has been. So generally traffic is staying higher than it had been um, before the pandemic. It's hard to say what will happen next. My assumption is that generally traffic will remain um, a, like at an industry level uh, around at least 10% higher or so as more people, again, still people are not able to do the same activities as before, but more people who started playing games continue to play games, people that were maybe not gamers before. Um, but yes, and you can also see that um, kind of please notice this period of April, uh, beginning of April to mid-May when the growth is negative because we're going to be looking at this period in, in um, the next slides as well. So um, now we're going to go into retention and we're going to see what happened over, over this period. So um, we're focusing on retention day seven for this because it's an indicator um, of kind of the general state of the industry. Um, and you can see that kind of that period uh, when, uh, when the growth started to be uh, negative. So when things, when traffic, oh, sorry, when uh, traffic started to go back to normal, there is a drop in retention. However, there is also an underlying trend in retention of retention day seven going slightly down across the industry. And the most affected by this are the best games. Um, it's interesting that um, this growth, it's, I think um, this change affects about kind of 10% of the ratio of retention. So we're going from about 25% for the top 2% of games to 22.5, so a drop of 2.5 absolute points. But the uh, change that you see in your particular studio or in each game will certainly depend on um, the actual genre of the game, so the mechanics uh, of, of the game. Um, some learnings here, however. Uh, we have seen that uh, traffic has grown and people try more games. But people also departed those games um, or they switched through multiple games instead of sticking to only one. So we have seen some growth. this growth in traffic led to a drop in retention in the following um, weeks. Uh, another thing to look at in this graph is that there is quite a big difference between the top games. All we're looking at here is top games. So we're looking at uh, only above the top 15% high performers. And between the top 15% and the top 2%, the, ret the retention day seven doubles. Um, it, it's, it's quite, um, so even when you start, your game starts to get good, um, there is an order of magnitude more than you can go to um, above that. Um, and because, um, and I, I wanna look at how this looks across regions as well, uh, because we just spoke about kind of the different events and I wanna put that into context before we look um, more specifically at um, genres. So we're gonna look at regions and platforms. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I like this graph is that you can really see, uh, like Europe behaves so, <laughs> like so conformist sometimes, you know, like um, it, retention starts off quite high. It's 30% at the beginning. And then there's a sudden drop um, and then stable at that level, then goes back up. Um, it's not really returning to normal yet. Shows some, showing some signs of recovery, not fully there. Um, but still, generally, the numbers are good. So even during the that kind of bottom period. Retention is about 26%, retention day seven. So it's quite good in Europe uh, compared to other regions. In the US, um, US states introduce lockdowns very gradually. Um, and they did it at different times. Um, and we can see that there is kind of a, a slower drop and then a faster recovery. Um, and retention is overall, a bit a bit lower uh, than uh, retention in in Europe, um, but still quite uh, quite good in general, close to close to thirty percent. Um, and if we look at platform, uh, this also paints uh, kind of an, an interesting picture. 
um, iOS users generally appear to be more stable. So they start off at about 25% globally, which is, you know, around generally the rate of the um, um, industry, let's say. Um, and it drops by about one full percentage point. Uh, but generally, generally, the, the numbers are stable. Whereas Android has kind of a slight, a slight continued uh, drop. And whereas iOS looks like it's slightly recovering, Android is not recovering at the same rate. Um, it's probably worth right now, um, and this applies to casual games, by the way, but it's probably worth right now truly looking at, um, at uh, your games um, and by platform as well, like making, the, making that differentiation. Um, if you look at it, at it and at your retention in aggregate, um, you may not get quite a clear picture of what's happening because by platform, uh, you may see different numbers um, overall retention is lower for Android. So whereas for iOS, it's close to 25%. So let's say between uh, 23, 25%. Um, for Android, it's under 20% for pretty much all of the year. So it's about 15, 20% in general lower uh, than it is for iOS. So um, it's worth uh, it's worth looking um, at that. And the overall impact of this period has has been generally higher. Um, something else that we've noticed, uh, we track a lot of hyper-casual games. We work with many of uh, the top hyper-casual publishers. And we have certainly just anecdotally noticed that the life cycle of games is getting very, very short. It, it used to be a couple of years ago, like two, three months, and then it became two, three weeks. And now it, it's truly like there's only a handful of days. Like you can see a game at the top for two, three days, and then there's another one. Um, so generally, uh, this trend was, uh, had started kind of last year with retention and hyper-casual um, decreasing, and it's continued to, to do so. Um, we do look at arcade for this because it's the genre most associated with hyper-casual. Um, the interesting thing is that for um, most, uh, most quantiles, so most games, um, now perform below a 15% um, day seven retention. Uh, whereas uh, um, before, uh, even earlier this year, it was um, much more normal to consider like above 15% good retention. So right now in particular, uh, the numbers are slightly lower than what people are used to. And again, it can be, it might be only temporary. It might be that all these gamers who started playing are now going back to their uh, regular lives or they shifted for many games. So maybe it's not an indication of necessarily a trend that's going to you know, impact this forever. But for certain, this is not something that new. Like I said, the drop started some, some time last year and um, it's really felt. I think I know publishers who were requesting like 20, 25% um, day seven retention. And now even for the top 2% of games, uh, this is um, below 20% and it's only around 17.5, 18%. So definitely these metrics need to be slightly updated to current reality if you are testing a game right now. Um, yeah, uh, one thing, there, there's also some, some better news um, compared to retention. So we're going to look at average session length. Um, and um, whereas total playtime changes in the industry, and you know uh, it, it changes also with the with the new players and with people trying more games, uh, average session length is looks pretty rock solid. It's it hasn't changed that much. Um, and uh, what I want to highlight uh, here in particular is that you know um, at, uh, we mentioned that between like the top fifteen percent and the top two percent of game retention doubles. But if we look um, at uh, average session length between the top 15% and the top 2% of games, uh, the difference is like five times. So truly, it, it may be that if you want to um, draw, increase the LTV of your players um, and you, your uh, model of monetization is primarily based on ads, you can probably get more ads in per session by increasing the session length um, rather than increasing your retention by a full percentage point. Um, if you can probably increase your session length by one, two minutes, 
um, that that could probably make a bigger difference. So um, definitely the difference is much, much higher in um, an average session length in terms of what is good versus what is great. Um, um, secondly, I want to, you know, um, sometimes these numbers for top um, um, session length, like what, what is the session length, average session length for top games look quite high. So I wanted to give you the top 10 of uh, the, um, I think this is actually, this is a top 2% for, um, by genre in, in casual in particular. Um, and I think for, for most people, um, these would be very relevant for core games. We see some crazy, crazy numbers where it's like you know, hours and hours. Um, but for casual games, um, you can clearly see a difference. And this is why we use the arcade genre where arcade has the lowest session length uh, and it's about half of everybody else's. Um, whereas uh, for all other genres, it's between like four, 45 minutes to um, an hour let's say, with action being kind of the next kind of in between those probably, you know, between kind of hyper and casual, uh, we see the action genre. Um, also, something that we see here is the more kind of classic a game like puzzle, um, you know, the higher retention, the higher ASL it has. Puzzle games always do great and everything. Um, so I uh, used, used to make a habit out of telling everybody to build a, a puzzle game. Um, um, and I want to show you uh, in particular, because we looked at um, arcade, um, I want to show you how this differs across quantile. So when we look, you know, at the top 2%, it looks like, you know, near half, near 30 minutes um, session length. And still, I, mean, I think many of you are probably wondering, like, who has that? Like, my game maybe has like four minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes. Um, and again, this, this is from the difference in the quantile. So top 15% of games have an average session length of six minutes, which is what most people identify as snackable hypercasual. However, top 2% of game is 30 minutes. So it's, there is a massive, massive difference in what you can get um, from these games in terms of average session length. So, so it's probably worth, even if, uh, you know, um, probably like the top 2% of games is arguable, maybe have some additional features that you may not be willing to add, but just going a bit above there um, can, can make a big, a big difference. And the multiplier really starts when we get like in the top 5%. So that's probably what you want to aim to kind of go from the top 15 to the top 10, top 5%. Um, Okay, and uh, looking a bit at uh, what's happening to the acquisition of users, like I said, our friends at Adjust have been really great in providing us with this data. Uh, we have this data for, for uh, the beginning of this year, so it goes to April right now, and we're working on updating this. Um, I focused on uh, Europe and North America for the top 10% um, of games across genres. Um, some broad uh, findings in here. <laughs> Europe is cheaper. Uh, this is perhaps not necessarily a surprise uh, because of course there are many countries in Europe and they all vary quite a lot. Um, however, the difference is significant. It, it's like about half as cheap as traffic in, in North America. Um, and it's a big market with some good uh, tier one, tier B plus, uh, A minus economies. And um, it's, um, it, it seems like um, some, like arcade, for instance, uh, you know, we're looking at five cents, um, which is quite low compared to like 14 cents in North America, which is, you know, something that everybody knows by heart. It's like uh, what, what the cost for an install for a hyper casual game. Um, again, uh, core games are more expensive, particularly RPGs, uh, role playing games are the most expensive games gambling, some of the most expensive CPIs, but generally for casual games, with the exception of hyper casual, we are looking in the US between 20 cents and let's say between 20 and 35 cents. And in Europe, we're looking between five and I would say adventure is a bit of an outlier because it's, um, um, it, it can behave sometimes a bit more like um, core, a core genre depending on the metric. Um, but it's generally between five cents and more like 10 cents. So it's, it, the difference is, is really, really high. Um, overall, um, 
in like what we've seen is that the numbers keep going down month to month. So in Europe, you can see that January is higher than April in uh, the US. Um, again, January is higher than April. So uh, CPIs have been going down, um, which is of course very positive for people who are generating good revenue from gaming right now. Like this is the time to grow um, your audience really. Um, and but also some genres are stable, you know, genres with generally stable committed players like card, casino, or RPG, core gamers, um, they, you know, that audience for those games was always engaged, they're still engaged right now. And they're still expected. Um, okay, so um, uh, rundown of our key learnings, uh, because we've looked at a lot. Um, there are some signs of the industry going back to normal. There's some signs of, um, you know, a traffic after it went down a bit. It's now kind of starting a normal organic growth curve. Again, usually June is a peak traffic month. I don't expect that peak this month it will be. Um, I don't expect we'll get back to April, early April levels. But um, certainly traffic seems to be resuming that normal pattern where it kind of goes up in June and then as people go off on holidays, reduces a bit in the summer and then goes back up in the cold season. Um, there is like retention is still, the fact that retention is decreasing is nothing new. Um, it's continuing. Uh, we do expect it to slightly for this um, decrease to kind of stabilize. Uh, but it depends. We still see it kind of generally trending downwards for Android more than iOS. Um, and we see the recovery being faster in the US rather than other regions. Um, average session length, um, highly stable. Um, it has a good potential as a core metric. People always look at it, but it's never treated as, oh my God, we have to increase session length. Retention is much more treated like that. And it's probably worth being handled in that way, if you're looking for multipliers in terms of revenue, like in increasing revenue 30%, 40%, 50%. Um, CPIs uh, are dropping right now, dropping almost across the board with the exception of literally two or three genres. Um, and Europe has on average higher, reten higher retention, let's say by about 10% overall, two percentage points up absolute uh, overall compared to the US North America, um, but has half the cost of the CPI. Um, so you can potentially make good margin right now from European players. And they also seem to be returning in games at higher levels in the past couple of weeks. Um, Yes, and that's pretty much it. There is um, much, much more um, in, in Benchmarks Plus that you can actually see. These are just some of the highlights in terms of what's been happening in the world literally until last week. Um, hopefully you find these uh, useful. Um, and I think we're going to go into some questions. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much, Iona. That was fantastic. Uh, we have had some questions that um, people have dropped into the, into the window there. Um, uh, I don't know whether uh, you can see them. I'll read them out because I'm not sure if everyone can see them. But um, um, go ahead. I think it's better if you. Yeah. If you, yeah. Um, so we've got the first question we've got here is: um, Do you think that the excess of free time during lockdown makes players look at the games in more detail and thus get bored faster? Um, so would that explain the jump between games? And then the follow-up question is: Is that an advantage to developers who are not in the top ten? Oh, that is a that is a good point. That is a silver lining indeed. So yeah, well. Um, I guess, you know, discovery still matters. So being at the top, in the top 10 is always good. People, more people will see you. However, yes, people may jump more between games. What I think is also happening is people are going through the um, content much quicker, like stuff that would, um, because they, they can have more sessions, even if the session length is the same, they can probably, what would have normally taken them like a full week to play, they can maybe now play in one day. Um, therefore, they're likely to either get to a level that is too hard or simply just be like, this is not for me, um, and switch. So I think there is potential with them um, switching games faster and them getting to your game, yes. But your game still has to be discovered, but fortunately, CPIs are low as well, so you can do that more. 
It's interesting, yeah, about the, um, the the different way people consume games, perhaps when they're in lockdown. I, I imagine that a lot of people play games when they're commuting, for instance, which uh, which would mean shorter pa- um, play times, just by nature of the uh, of the experience. Whether they're sat at home, they can they can play games uh, and devote more time to it. So um, what, what's interesting, uh, sorry, but that mm-hmm. I would have assumed that uh, average session length would go down, like would go either up or down if that's the case, but it hasn't really. So it may be that people have a bit either they're, they're just following the same habits, like uh, they're playing the same amount of time in a single session that they're doing during their commute. They're just doing like like before they sit down to cook <laughs> or, or um, you know, uh, they're just splitting in a multiple session and navigating between apps and so on and taking breaks. But actually, uh, it's the number of sessions that's this of sessions that's changed, not the individual session. So speaking of which, actually, we've got a question here about um, average session length. Um, as the ASL is so low in hyper casual, do events in games help increase the ASL or interest in the game? Is there any data showing that live ops heavy games are taking better advantage of the average session length? Um, I can tell you that. So I can tell you this anecdotally that uh, generally, yes. Yeah. So games that do live ops are more, um, you know, casual with core features. Those games always, always have like this is adventure is such a type of kind of casual game, right? What we saw like where CPIs are higher, session lengths are higher. Um, so yes, for sure. And uh, like I said, uh, hyper casual is notoriously low in live ops, and you can see that it again has the half the session length of everything else. So for sure, I think adding content events um, can help you know double your session length as long as it makes sense with the game design, of course. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a couple more questions actually, so I'll, I'll just keep going. And please, we've got a few minutes, everyone, so do drop some more questions in as people have been. Um, so, uh, Sai asks, what are what are the game cycles for hyper casuals? Um, so that is um, that is a good question. So, um, you know, obviously there is no right answer to this. Is the kind of thing with. Um, where you can have a game that has really high metrics, but still like goes up and down because everything is so driven by how much you invest in the game. Um, uh, again, anecdotally, what we see is that um, certainly um, still, I mean, let me give, uh, let me split my answer in two so I don't give like a wrong answer. Um, good games, even in hyper casual, can have a lifetime of more than a year. However, they will not necessarily be top charting in the top 20 for the full year. They will have a peak and then they will go slightly down. And then they'll, uh, when, as you do updates, they'll go up and down, but they'll hover somewhere between like the top 50 and the top 20 in, in that range. You can still see these games usually six months later. Um, where they stay due to a large amount of players that they've accumulated over time and some ongoing some ongoing promotion. So if you're referring to that, you can have a game that lasts for six months or 12 months even. If it's only, to be sure, only the really, really, really good games, like the ones that have been super hits are still there 12 months later. But um, in short term, again, like it's, it can be a week now, it can be two weeks. I, I, there's, I, I, I haven't seen a game, I think, really being top ranking i think for like a month and a half this year really not i mean i can't think of one maybe there has been but i can't think of one right now that we've truly followed like that um great thank you and i'll tell you what we've got uh we've got another speaker coming on in a couple of minutes but there's one more question so let's let's do this one and then uh, that can be our last question so um an anonymous uh, attendee asks how is the trend of eCPMs for ad monetization across geos and ad formats? Um, so hopefully in the next one, we're going to be able to do this as well. We're just starting to collect ad revenue in game analytics. If anybody does work with us in here, we're going to put out an article on this and we're going to have our own eCPM benchmarks. I cannot wait. But uh, mm-hmm. generally, it's been, uh, depends a lot uh, uh, with, uh, with the region. So for instance, Asian eCPMs have been far stronger than uh, North America and Europe. Um, that I know of, um, because, you know, over there kind of things, uh, you know, blew in the, like went down a bit in the beginning and then went back up, especially China. China seems to be doing quite well. 
And um, North America, uh, Europe, things um, have decreased because there's less, uh, there's less advertiser competition in the market. I've heard anything from like 10% to 50% drops in eCPMs um, with people who were more brand dependent being more impacted. So um, literally, if most of your advertising relies on other, but even so, if it's other games, like generally, I would expect that you would have seen at least like 20% or something like that impact if you're not very Asia focused. Great, thank you. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, Iona, thank you very much. Um, Iona uh, Harentnicic, the CEO of Game Analytics, um, email on the screen. And if also if people want to catch up with you, I imagine they can find you in the Meet to Match meeting system as well, right? But um, yes, yes, they absolutely uh, can. Thank uh, you, everyone. Uh, you're going to have, because uh, I'm going to give you a round of applause. You're going to have to imagine it coming from everyone else because they're all virtual. <laughs> thank you so uh, much. But but thank you very much for for, for joining us, and, and that, that's fantastic. And hopefully we'll catch up with you again at a, at a future event too.